quase 60 anos, nos juntamos para criar a BPI. Nosso propósito é valorizar e proteger a propriedade intelectual no Brasil. A propriedade intelectual é marco fundador das sociedades modernas. Ela é a instituição que reconhece o papel fundamental do trabalho intelectual na construção do desenvolvimento material, humano e cultural. Ele confere estatura legal. Foi longo o caminho que se percorreu desde que os primeiros estados conferiram direitos a artistas e inventores até a consolidação de um entendimento global sobre a proteção da propriedade intelectual. Este esforço nunca estará concluído. O gênio humano se expande em velocidade combinatória sobre o acúmulo crescente do que foi anteriormente criado. Seu avanço transcende as formas de expressão e as modalidades de interação existentes a cada momento. Surgem continuamente desafios aos estatutos legais e às formas usuais de redigir contratos. Os regimes de propriedade devem facilitar a interação transmitir confiança e promover a colaboração em todos os campos da criação. A ABPI é instrumento de todos que entendemos que criatividade e inovação são as chaves para o desenvolvimento humano e o progresso material. Agimos para promover o aperfeiçoamento contínuo da legislação brasileira sobre propriedade intelectual, arte, cultura e inovação, em conformidade com as melhores práticas internacionais central neste esforço é agregar todos os atores relevantes em torno de uma agenda de atividades que propicie a troca de informações e a ação conjunta. É hora de nos unirmos para combater a Covid-19. É nossa obrigação incentivar e promover o reconhecimento do esforço inventivo de nossos cientistas e profissionais de saúde. Vamos trabalhar juntos para que esse esforço seja coroado por benefícios para a saúde dos brasileiros e de todas as populações afetadas no menor prazo possível. A ABPI está engajada em orientar legisladores e gestores, públicos e privados, quanto às maneiras mais eficientes de proteger soluções tecnológicas, novos equipamentos, medicamentos e outros insumos e ajudar a contratar a sua mais eficiente disseminação. Participe! A ABPI está sempre aberta para quem quer ajudar a promover a inovação e contribuir para superar desafios como o enfrentamento da Covid-19. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Brazilian IP Association, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and TIPSA, the Transatlantic IP Academy, we welcome you all to the third edition of IP Meetings, a series of webinars about the most relevant and current to topics on IP, organized by WIPO and ABPI in partnership. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We welcome the authorities connected here with us, Mr. Luiz Edgar Montauri Pimenta, President of the Brazilian IP Association. Mr. José Graça Aranha, Regional Director of WIPO Rio de Janeiro. Mr. Lohan Manderrier, Director of the Transatlantic IP Academy. We also welcome our special guests, Mr. Álvaro Loureiro, President of the Brazilian Association of IP Attorneys. Ms. Elizabeth Simpson do Amaral, President of the Inter-American Association of Intellectual Property. Mr. Fabiano Barreto, Policy and Industry Specialist at CNE, the Brazilian National Confederation of Industry. Mr. Felipe Daneman Lundgren, President of the IP Committee of the Brazilian Bar Association, Rio de Janeiro Section. Mr. Luiz Henrique do Amaral, Vice President of AIPPI, the International Association for the Protection of Intellectual Property. 
Mr. Kenji Kainuma, IP Director of Japan External Trade Organization, São Paulo Branch. Mr. Marcelo do Nascimento, President of ASP, the IP Association from São Paulo. Mr. Paulo Parente Marques Mendes, President of the Brazilian Group of the International League of Competition Law. Please feel welcome. We are now opening the, the ceremony with the welcome remarks by Mr. Montauri Pimenta, President of ABPI. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this today is a holiday in Brazil, so I would like to thank you, all, our audience, uh, uh, because taking a holiday to join us in this very interesting topic, uh, which is our seminar uh, is about today, making your business digital, how IP can help you. And I would like to uh, say hi to my colleagues in the opening uh, session, José Graçaranha, uh, an old friend of mine, very old one, uh, uh, from Waipo, Brazil, and Mr. Lohan Monderrier, director of the Transatlantic IP Academy and professor at Bocconi University in Milan, Italy. Uh, I would love, uh, also like to, to talk about uh, ABPI a little bit. Uh, we will have our international congress this year uh, in the month of October. We are just finalizing the organization of our event, which we held every year, uh, not virtual, but this year we will be announcing soon how the Congress is going to be. And I will pass my, the words now for uh, my colleague from the board of ABPI, Felipe Fontelis, in order to, sorry, I pass to Graçaranha uh, to say some words, and then I, he, he will pass on to my other colleagues. Thank you again for joining us, and everybody keep safe in these difficult times that we are facing. Thank you, Mr. Montari, for your message. We are now going to listen to Mr. Graça Aranha, Regional Director of WIPO, Rio de Janeiro. Thank you, Erika. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I thank uh, ABPI and TIPSA for the co-organization of this event. I say a big hello to my friends on the table. Luis Edgar Montauri said we, I'm an old friend of his. I'm very happy that uh, we can see from the image when he's there speaking. Uh, thanks to the glasses behind, he's in front of the sea with boats and palm trees and everything. So I'm in the office despite the fact that today is, um, is a bank holiday, Corpus Christi, uh, here in Brazil. I, I welcome and I say a big hello to my very good old friend, colleague, Laurent Monderieux. Laurent and I met many years ago in Geneva, in WIPO, um, during the 90s. I don't know who joined WIPO first, if it was him or me, but I remember very well when I was back in Brazil for the first time um, at the end, at the beginning of, uh, between 1999 and 2002, Laurent visited us at MP to see the work that um, we were carrying out in terms of, of promoting IP and the type of publications we carrying out, we were implementing. Um, nowadays, Laurent is a director of the Transatlantic IP Academy. He's a professor of law in Milan, Bocconi University Milan, as Montauri, my good old friend, also, also mentioned. Uh, digital transformation has been a, a, it's a vital aspect for companies to ensure their market share. Especially now we see the pandemic 
crisis and the social distance measures that uh, are imposed on us uh, for about three months, uh, this issue has become critical and it will remain for a long time. I just uh, got the information that um, uh, Europe is going to close the border to nationals of Brazil, traveling from Brazil. The US has done it until the pandemic is controlled in our country. And it seems that uh, unfortunately, still a big, a long way ahead until this problem is, is solved. Um, so it's a critical aspect, and one of the most critical aspects of digital transformation involves intellectual property. How to manage your IP portfolio uh, in, a, in a digital environment, how to register your, your assets, your trademarks, how to file your patent applications, how to ensure the use of domain names, etc., etc., etc. WIPO is fully teleworking now, um, although Geneva, Switzerland has been uh, reopening in view of the, of the huge efforts that were made before. They are managing to, they managed to control the, the illness like, uh, like in Italy where Laurent, uh, my good friend Laurent lives today. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we're still, we're still uh, on the way upwards. So um, WIPO, as I said, uh, has undergone in the recent years a big transformation, digital transformation. And thanks to that, the organization is fully, fully in conformity with this process. Everyone, as I mentioned, is still working at from home. And uh, we have eight external offices that are also working uh, in different countries and, and working from home in an effective way. Um, I, I, today we join hands with uh, ABPI and the Transatlantic IP Academy to promote debates on, on, on the digital transformation. We have the privilege to count with Laurent, as I mentioned, and with Mr. Eldred Howder, two internationally uh, renowned uh, experts in discussions, in emerging discussions and digital transformation. Um, I hope that, um, that uh, you will enjoy uh, this meeting and, uh, and then we'll, we will, Felipe Fontel is also from ADPI, will talk, he's a partner, in the technology area of Daneman Simpson, is an author of a book, Data Protection and Business Activities. So I hope everyone present here in this webinar will enjoy uh, this event that um, we are organizing uh, in these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grassaranha, for your kind words. We now pass on to Mr. Lohan Manderieu, Director of the Transatlantic IP Academy for his welcome speech. Thank you very much, dear uh, colleagues, dear friends, dear participants. It is uh, an honor and a pleasure for the Transatlantic IP Academy to be associated to uh, this splendid initiative carried out by uh, ABPI and WIPO. Uh, for promoting digital transformation uh, with IP. Uh, the Transatlantic IP Academy uh, gathers the uh, cutting edge academics uh, on issues that interest uh, development and uh, growth on both sides of the Atlantic. And for us, this is really a first event done formally as such as Transatlantic IP Academy with Brazil. We are particularly uh, uh, grateful to uh, Luis and Jose and to uh, Felipe and uh, Eldar later on to be with us uh, in this event. We are uh, particularly grateful because at this very time where uh, our societies suffered and suffer for many of them confinement and restrictions, 
we all understand that the, digi the digital transformation, an agenda that uh, is ours at Transatlantic IP Academy for more than a decade, is really an, a cutting edge agenda, an agenda which is super important to carry forward in order to uh, develop with growth. In the past months, and for many countries still nowadays, we wouldn't be able, we, we wouldn't have been able to live in the way we could or to survive in the way we could without digital technologies. This permitted us to um, have contacts with our friends, with our family members far away. This permitted us to, for many of us, to continue to work. This permitted to business to continue to operate, though in very difficult conditions. And there is no single doubt that digital transformation is exactly uh, accelerated by the current pandemia. Uh, one effect, and there is no, uh, at this point, no reason in questioning whether it's a good or a bad effect. One, sure, one effect for sure is that the current digital, um, the current pandemia accelerates digital transformation by further use of artificial intelligence, of Internet of Things, of uh, uh, 3D printing, of blockchain production. By all means, this affects us. This affects us in a positive way in this very case, and intellectual property is next to all of us and to all business operators to support in this very case a new society that is being developed. So uh, despite the uh, sad circumstances of the uh, pandemia, in this sad world that we are all experiencing in a way or another, we see some light and uh, one of the elements of light is connected with the digital transformation. This is why I feel so honored of the invitation of uh, ABPI and of WIPO. Upon uh, WIPO's suggestion, I'm really, really happy. And uh, I thank uh, Director uh, Jose Grassaragna, my uh, friend for um, many decades nowadays, uh, to. Uh, uh, to have invited me uh, jointly with ABPI for um, our Transatlantic Academy. We also hope that this will permit to develop projects with South America, with Brazil, uh, Brazil being half of South America. It is very, very important for us also that uh, we associate Brazilian colleagues and friends to this adventure that we have developed for uh, now uh, 13 years. So uh, I wouldn't wish to keep the floor too long in this uh, uh, general introductory phase. Uh, I would really uh, wish also uh, that many participants can interact. We are here to listen. Um, academics such as uh, Professor Elda Haber and myself should listen at a society in the form of uh, businessmen and also civil society to understand what are the needs and not only will we do uh, under the uh, expert uh, leadership of our moderator, not only will we present, but we will also be next to you to reply to your questions and uh, to uh, create as such a chain of solidarity. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, splendid uh, event. Merci, Laurent. So thank you all again for joining us. Um, if you have any question, I kindly ask you to wait until the end of the session. We will be able to publicly make your question. Um, I wish you all a very nice webinar. Well, we went from being the Flintstones to the Jetsons in nine months, says Dan Schumann from PayPal. This statement from Dan depicts a perfect metaphor for the speed of digital innovation. In fact, the need for digital transformation has swept over business all over the world in a matter of a couple of weeks. How intellectual property can help you make your business digital is a key question that may really change the perspectives on business. And of course, we are very proud to have Mr. Adal, Mr. Lohan answer this question for us today. We will now turn time over to our moderator, Mr. Felipe Fontelis. Mr. Felipe Fontelis Cabral is a lawyer, industrial property agent, and partner at Denim and Simpson Law Firm. He has a master's degree 
LLM from Rio de Janeiro State University, UERJ, where he developed studies on internet technologies and personal data protection. Philip is a member of Council of ABPI and co-chair of KnowledgeNet at IAPP, International Association of Privacy Professionals. He's author of the book, Protection of Personal Data in Business Activities, published by Lumen Juris in 2019. Felipe. Thank you, Erica. Uh, can you all hear me well? I can't hear you. Okay, very good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, first of all, to WIPO, to TIPSA, and to ABPI for inviting me to, to participate in this panel to gather your uh, references, two references in the academic field of intellectual property. And also congratulations to WIPO, to ABPI, and to TIPSA for organizing this webinar and to choosing this specific topic. So congrats to Mr. Luis Edgar, congrats to uh, Mr. José Grassaranha and to Professor Laurent for organizing the meeting. And also to the people behind the scenes who make it happen, uh, Ms. Isabella Pimentel from WIPO and also Ms. Erika Diniz from ABPI. Making your business digital, how IP can help you. This topic is fascinating because it connects two very important aspects of any businesses in 2020. As just my colleagues mentioned, uh, the pandemic accelerated a little bit the digital transformation, but there is no doubt that uh, uh, several companies have been uh, uh, going through this digital information. And we can either say that a uh, business that does not use uh, digital tools nowadays uh, it may uh, even have difficulties in surviving. We, I, I cannot imagine uh, a business that wouldn't use digital tools nowadays, either for their internal processes, to make their internal processes more efficient, or even to make uh, uh, their experience for customers personalized. Fact is, uh, as my colleagues just mentioned, the digital business is here to stay. And it may be, have been accelerated by the pandemic, but no doubt, that it's here to stay. Actually, I just read uh, uh, last week about a, a patent, try, trying to connect a little bit with intellectual property. I just read about a patent that has been filed by Apple, which uh, makes it possible for you to take a photo, a selfie photo from different places. So people from different places, they connect to the software and they can take this, the the, the photos and make a selfie of all of them all together. So can you imagine how useful this, this patent and this software and this tool is nowadays that we must live in distance, in isolation. So this is a very practical example on how the digital uh, revolution can help us. Talking about the digital revolution and uh, also big data, a very good, uh, a very good example of a digital transformation. We must take uh, in our minds that it takes a little bit of investment for a company to enter this digital transformation. And it's also uh, uh, very tough for companies, and especially small and medium enterprises, to choose whether or not to invest on their operations or to invest in technologies, or either to invest in, in intellectual property in general. Actually, there is, there is a, a very famous book called Big Data from uh, Professor, uh, Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger from uh, Oxford University. Uh, Professor Victor argues that considering the power of the digital transformation and also the power of big data, it is possible that within some years, medium-sized companies will be simply wiped out of the map. Because big companies, they do have money to invest in technology. Small companies, they don't need so much technology because they live uh, with basis on a very regional uh, trade. So medium-sized companies will have difficulties in competing with uh, uh, both of them. So now we come to the question. So should they invest in technology? Should they invest in IP? Wouldn't it be great if technology, digital technology, digital transformation, and intellectual property could 
uh, converge and could uh, come out together, could benefit from each other. This is the topic that we are talking today, the challenge of the, our speakers of today. So making IP, how IP may help you make your business digital. This is the challenges for our speakers, and uh, I'm going to present them now. The first speaker is going to be uh, Professor Laurent Mondrieu. Uh, professor Laurent is Professor of Intellectual Property at Bocconi University of Milan, Italy, member of Dic Dictorate Board Bocconi LLM in Law of Internet Technology, I'm sorry, a director, Bocconi Summer Schools in Law, chair, European IP Teachers Network, coordinator of Transatlantic IP Academy, and is invited professor, lecturer of intellectual property law in universities and training institutes in many countries of Europe, the Americas, Asia, and Africa as well. In addition to his IP teaching, numerous publications and IP research activities at Bocconi, one of the most prestigious and high-ranked university in the European Union, Lohan is senior intellectual property expert for various international organizations and governments. He was for many years official and senior official at the World IP Organization, WIPO in Geneva, Switzerland, in particular as head WIPO Public Affairs and Media Relations. Before joining WIPO, he also worked for the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome at the European Union in Brussels. Over the last two decades, he wrote numerous publications and studies and undertook international projects for the EU, EPO, UNDP, UNCTAD, WIPO, IDLO, and OIF, and various governments. In this context, uh, Professor Aloha visited some 140 countries. He works in French, English, Italian, Spanish, and German. Also, we'll have to, uh, together with us uh, Dr. Elder Haber. He is Associate Professor, Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Haifa University, and a member of the Haifa Center for Law and Technology and the Center for Cyber Law and Policy. He served as Fellow and a Faculty Associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University from 2015 to 2018, his main research interests consist of various facets of law and technology, including cyber law, intellectual property law, focusing mainly on copyright, privacy, civil rights and liberties, and criminal law. His works were published in various flagship law reviews worldwide, including top specialized law and technology journals of US universities, such as Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. And he is author of Criminal Copyright, a book published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. The ES, Dr. Elda won several academic awards, such as IAPP Best Privacy Paper Award in the EU. In the EU. He works uh, frequently presented in various workshops and conferences around the globe. And he was seated in academic papers governmental reports in the media and U.S. federal courts. So this is the challenge for our speakers today, how IP may help you make your business digital. Mohan and Elda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe, for your kind words and uh, for your generous presentations uh, of both of us. Uh, we organized uh, our time uh, as speakers with Eldar. I will start and then Eldar will continue. So, and then we will uh, uh, reply uh, all the time to our moderator, which should be free to interrupt us as well. And then we will reply to uh, questions from the moderator and from the public. Uh, well, dear participants, the uh, topic of digital transformation uh, strikes us in two aspects. First of all, for those who are working, who are working with IP, who are in the IP family, as uh, brilliantly mentioned by Director José Grassa Arana, the uh, the operations of the uh, intellectual property offices get more digitalized 
um, actually operations could continue thanks to the digital transformation that had already taken place and that is being accelerated of WIPO and the largest IP offices in the world. That's for the uh, strict business of the IP family. Luckily enough, Brazil is in a very positive position in this respect because many IP firms have already entered into the digital transformation, managed to apply and file electronically, and as such, are not left without resources in this very complex situation. This is for the IP family for our family. What our IP fam family faces is at times that are not so easy also for the IP family. Uh, uh, our IP family faces the need to support the uh, transformation of society, a transformation that has taken place at an incredible pace over the last three months towards digital transformation. And companies, in particular the smaller ones, uh, in all countries of the world, try to become digital. And there, it is our duty to support them, to try uh, to bring them the uh, expertise, but also the avenues that they need in order to uh, support our activity, in order to uh, uh, to, sorry, to support their activity. So as such, the digital transformation taken from the IP specialist point of view is showing that IP may help companies in becoming more efficient, in becoming stronger uh, and in competing in better terms. Big companies are better equipped, but not always. Sometimes big companies that are not that high tech oriented are heavy in their management. Small companies, for many of them, have problems, except if they are high tech companies. Uh, Professor Eldar Haber and myself sought to divide our presentation by showing IP right by IP right what may be the uh, advantages that we may gain from the digital transformation. Before making this choice, we shared it with our uh, esteemed moderator, Philippi, uh, so that uh, we uh, work on a common line. I shall uh, concentrate on how patents, trademarks, industrial designs support the digital transformation. So companies, whether they have traditional established businesses or want to grow in another way, need to make this change or to accelerate it. They need to accelerate it. And we know from uh, literature in our case that uh, Brazil didn't wait for the current crisis and embarked already several years ago in various plans in order to uh, support this transformation. So there are various uh, programs, there is a governance program for the Internet of Things to promote the Internet of Things, um, international um, organizations and those who establish parameters on the growth of artificial intelligence research and applications show that Brazil is in a, a very good position, in one of the best ones in Latin America, though clearly enough the lead in artificial intelligence is somewhere in Eastern Asia, somewhere between China, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and in the west coast of the US. Uh, Brazil compares gloriously with Europe and with uh, other parts of the world. So as such, uh, we are uh, happy and honored to uh, talk to a public who uh, knows that there are developments, though from theory to practice, there is a gap. Um, 3D printing accelerated its development during the current crisis, since many tools, instead including protective tools against the pandemic, uh, can be produced thanks to 3D printing. 
So these are a few examples going away from the usually discussed and very important and crucial discussed topic of medicines, uh, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, Internet of Things, and of course, hopefully for all of us, medicines, uh, will help us uh, to uh, further grow in the first coming years. After the recession, we will, or we are already all experiences. These are the avenues for growth. So all these avenues that are offered to Brazilian companies in uh, the field of artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, 3D uh, development, 3D printing development, also blockchain operations are accelerated and correspond to uh, the need for using intellectual property rights. Naturally, Brazilian companies from small to big, from big to small, need to be better equipped with software. So Brazilian law, so the specific Brazilian law establishes that software is protected by copyright, there is no single doubt that if Brazilian companies are software producers uh, and they need and they hope to sell their software abroad, so not only if they are software consumers, but if they are software developers of a certain quality, if they have expectations to uh, protect abroad in many countries, they will need to get better protection to uh, file patents. And in this very case, software, which is from a basic stage to a very elaborated stage, uh, an artificial intelligence tool, uh, software may need patent protection. And in this very respect, for those of our uh, participants today who come from uh, SMEs, do remember, please, that abroad, outside Brazil, you need, you may need to protect your, um, your creativity, not only through copyright, but also through patents. Uh, this is a matter of fact, uh, though uh, I belong to a part of the world, Europe, which is also favorable, such as Brazil, to protection of software via copyright. There is no single doubt that uh, Another part of the world, many countries favor patents for software and software developers, software developing companies should remember that they um, need in some areas of the world. Yeah, it looks like uh, we lost Lohan. Um, Felipe, um, what should we, you suggest? Do we go through? I think, yeah, I, I think both, uh, both presentations are very well connected. Uh, so I think we can pass the word to uh, Professor Elda and then uh, back to Lohan so he can conclude his rationale. Sure. Uh, thank you, Felipe, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will briefly say also thank you for WIPO and TIPSA and ABPI uh, for hosting this important event. Uh, I think it is super crucial these days to talk about uh, how businesses, whether small, medium or big ones, uh, are transforming into this uh, pandemic, but not only this pandemic, but rather talking about digital transformation uh, in light of various changes that uh, uh, we are experiencing and uh, within the notion of intellectual property. So I'm gonna continue what Laurent uh, began to talk about within the law, he started to talk about patents within innovation and the need to, uh, to use patents uh, in general. And we will continue this discussion uh, once uh, Laurent is back. Uh, I want to take this further to copyright because uh, Laurent started to talk about software. And as he uh, mentioned, copyright usually, copyright law usually protects software. So this is one of the, uh, the examples that I'm going to discuss. But first, I have to discuss the internet in general. My talk is going to be divided between the internet, the use of the internet, the rise in the use of the internet that we all use right now due to this pandemic, due to the virus, and uh, uh, we are experiencing more work 
uh, work to work uh, issues that have uh, relations to the internet. We are, I am teaching online, for instance, many businesses had to transform their businesses online. And the question here is where IP uh, plays and I will talk about that in a second. Uh, but knowing IP better, and I think this is the gist of our conversation, understanding that intellectual property laws uh, copyright, trade secrets, trademarks, industrial designs, and patents are actually, could actually foster your business when we're going into this transition. Now, the second part of my talk will discuss internet, but not internet as we know it, not the internet that we're using right now to communicate via our laptops or, or computers or uh, our mobile phones, but rather what we call the internet of things, the IoT, the AI. The, the artificial intelligence which helps these different devices to be connected to the internet all the time. And these things could lead us, whether we have pandemics or not, to a new industrial revolution, what it's called Industry 4.0 or the industrial, the fourth industrial revolution. And now is a perfect time to start uh, getting ahead of ourselves in the sense of we have to be prepared for this revolution because this revolution is gonna change how we work anyhow, without even uh, going to COVID-19. So I will talk about both aspects and I will start with the internet itself. And I will indicate that this crisis is a huge opportunity for change and it's a huge opportunity for all of us to be better acquainted with the IP laws that could help foster our businesses today. So when I talk about the internet, as I said, and I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we use it now for everything. We use it to do everything that uh, it comes to mind. And for that, we cannot stay in the realm of the physical world anymore. Businesses have to go online. They have to make shipments. They have to communicate. They have to do all these things. Now, these things, this communication, which occurs through the internet has two mechanisms which are very, very important. One of them is intellectual property laws, which I will briefly discuss. And the second one, which I will discuss at the end, is the data regime. What governs data in general? So I will talk about databases in general, but I will also discuss uh, data rights in other contexts. So starting with copyright. Uh, Copyright is a very dominant IP right. It's, it's generally domestic in nature in the sense that much like any IP law, every country has their own copyright law. Uh, Brazil has one from 1998, uh, Israel from 2007. However, if you look at the IP laws, there are a lot of similarities. Why is that? Because we have harmonization in intellectual property. To some extent, we have similar things that are applied similarly in various countries around the world. So they, there could be a threshold which they all have to meet, uh, like the amount of time that we are granting the IP right. So how does copyright relate to this internet thing? Well, everything that you see online could be copyrighted from the text you see, uh, any content and uh, that you see like texts or photographs or video clips or music, they're all copyrighted probably, perhaps not, and I will discuss it in a second. But then when we're going online as a business, we need to know what can we use. Now, this is where IP stands. This is where IP enters and basically tells us, copyright law will tell us what can we use and what can't we use. So as a business, that sounds like something which I can either go and take three stacks back and say, well, this is too frightening for me to start handling the copyright, the mechanism, how would I know who has the right? How do I know how to obtain a right, et cetera? Well, actually, this is part of the things that copyright law does. It fosters this. So you might, first of all, take things that could be what in what we call the public domain. Some things could be even uh, uh, with copyright that has expired already, so they are freely to use in general. Uh, some things are not copyrighted at all because their artists and makers and, and creators have decided that we can use them for a license, for instance. And finally, we have licenses. We have a huge regime that can enable anyone from small business to big business for the, indivi for the individual person to basically obtain a license to use 
any photographs, any text, any image that they see and they want to use in their business, uh, usually and often not for large sums of money. Uh, it could be very negligible in terms of companies and you can be granted the permission to use it uh, to, for your business purposes. This stands for the entire website that you're promoting, and I will get to the databases in a second as well. So as I said, we can when we're going online and we don't have that, right now we do have to go online in many instances. Many companies around the world had to transform in a second. And if you're not prepared for that, and if you don't understand IP law, then your business is not going into the right direction to that extent. So this is why understanding your copyright law and copyright regime in general is something that it's very, very advisable for companies at this age, knowing what can you obtain and what can you do. On the other hand of this map, you also create copyright. When you use your website and you create your own website, it doesn't have to be a website per se, it could be your app, your application, it could be a social media account for your company or for your business, all of these things could be protected by IP law, by copyright law, by patent sometimes. Uh, and you produce these things that might get protection. So if someone else infringes upon your rights, you might have the right to, uh, to exercise your rights and actually prevent others from doing things that harm your business. So this is where IP stands when you are the producer of your own content and you're producing your own videos or music or text even in your website and you can use these IP laws uh, to basically safeguard the things that you're working so hard on them. So the first type that we talked about is copyright law and we used websites as one of the things that one of the applications and apps and social media accounts. We have to bear in mind generally of the license regime. And one might ask, how do I obtain the license? How do I find it? So in copyright law, we have generally in every country in Brazil as well, we have collective management organizations, what is called usually CMOs, which you can basically uh, approach and you can see whatever they have and you can see which rights you want to obtain or for the license. And you can go online and you can go online and basically pay for the things that you want in, in the license and use them. And you can also produce your own and sell them or license them. So uh, in that act, to that extent, copyright helps your business to thrive in the sense of the websites and the social media accounts and all of the different aspects uh, that going online, your online persona uh, might uh, develop within uh, the next crisis or this one as well. But it also stands for software. So as Laurent started to say, he was talking about patents. It depends on the IP jurisdiction, but patents uh, or in copyright could protect computer software, which means that your uh, the apps that you acquire or you uh, produce uh, could be and should be protected by copyright law. So in both ends, you have to just basically know and realize what stands behind uh, software and either uh, make money out of it or, or uh, exercise someone else rights in the sense of a license. Um, also, you have to bear in mind when we talk about copyright law that copyright law promotes a lot of different uh, um, uh, use of knowledge in the sense that it sometimes has exceptions. So sometimes you can use copyright and that would largely depend on the copyright regime that you are within. So uh, in Israel, for instance, much like in the US, there's something which is called the fair use doctrine by which you can use some things uh, for some purposes uh, without paying and without even uh, requesting a permission. But I have to say that this is a fair use is a is an exception, nor not the rule, and it's it doesn't exist in Brazil to that extent, or in most countries in the world. Uh, but there are some variations of these exceptions. Sometimes you can use some things that are copyrighted, and even perhaps you can use them without permission, which means that uh, this is where copyright law balances between innovation uh, uh, and creativity and uh, all the things that we try to foster through these laws. So. Uh, I want to move from copyright law to other things that are also important within this meeting. So one of them would be trade secrets. 
And I'm not talking even in the very traditional uh, way of, of uh, talking about trade secrets, which are information that is, are used in businesses uh, that are maintained in confidence, in confidentiality through reasonable and appropriate efforts. And it has independent economic value by virtue of that confidentiality. It basically means that if you have something which is very important for your business and you keep it very confident, you only tell your employers that have to know the, the secret, your business secret, but they don't tell anyone else, then you can actually exercise this right, which is uh, it's called a trade secret. Now, why is this so important? Think of the, your business going online. I'm not even talking about websites right now. I'm talking about general communication. You're communicating through emails. This is something that we've done before. And texts, messages, or WhatsApp, or any other applications, we've done that before. But COVID-19 has ma made us start using these softwares, like Zoom that we're using right now, or other softwares uh, that we have to hold meetings, remote meetings. And we might talk about sensitive data. So we have to bear in mind when we're doing that, is what we're doing secure enough? Are we keeping this confidential? What are we talking when we're talking about online? Can someone else gain access to what we're talking on? Can a hacker gain access? So those things are important and I will address them in a few minutes as well in the terms of what we call cyber security, something which, which we all bear in mind when going online, but it's also very, very relevant for the laws of IP in general uh, and in trade secrets. So how do we achieve secrecy? What dilemmas do we have online in that extent? We have to bear in mind that security and confidentiality of the things that we talk about online are just as important as if they were offline. And we have to bear in mind that this technology could actually help us make, thing, make things more secure, whether it is by uh, uh, different applications that uh, hold cybersecurity measures, strong cybersecurity measures. It could be by blockchain, like Ron said before, and other types of security measures. This moves us to the next and final uh, uh, theme that I want to discuss, which is data. We're producing a lot of data. We, data is the new oil, as we said, and it's gonna be more and more productive for our uh, sense and for our business. It's not only for marketing purposes, it's also important, but data becomes uh, the new way for us to communicate, the new way for us uh, to understand each other better because data analysis, especially in COVID-19, and it will grow on to what I call the Industrial Revolution 4.0, uh, data is at the, at the heart of the businesses that we are, uh, we are making these days. So how does that relate to everything we are talking about? First of all, we have databases. When we're going online, we, have, we are creating mass amount of data, which is our own. There are our own database, and one of the legal questions is, do we have a database right? Because it's not exactly copyright in the sense of creativity, but databases could and often do enjoy a legal protection. They exist to recognize the investment that was made in compiling that database, while it is not creative to the sense of copyright law. It also it is generally protected under the main agreements in intellectual property, like that of TRIPS, the very famous one. Uh, in some, uh, uh, under some circumstances, it is protected in the EU to some extent. It, it is protected in Brazil to some extent, and it usually lasts for. It depends on the country. It could last for more, but it usually lasts for 15 years. Now, these databases and this data is the move towards the new reality by which we are going to experience various types of automations. Businesses will go to what we call the Industrial Revolution 4.0. That means that we have more of these devices. This is the IoT beginning now, uh, Internet of Things. More devices are connected to the Internet. Things get much cheaper and smaller. You can connect chips everywhere. But within this revolution, we have another revolution, which is called AI, and we are all often hear about it, artificial intelligence, but it's not necessarily the artificial intelligence that we see in science fiction movies. It could be, but it's not there right now. 
what uh, we see, what we will see and experience, and this is what many companies are working, is the move towards automation. So we will have more autonomous things, autonomous vehicles, autonomous machines, autonomous factories. And the, what, what COVID-19 has taught us, amongst other things, is that this move towards automation isn't something we should fear in the sense that, oh, machines are going to take over our lives and jobs, etc. There are things that we need to work out there. But this is not the main fear because in COVID-19, in the split of a second, the world has to go, had to go from full contact to no contact. We, f- we had to go to a world whereby machines will have to, or in, in a good sense, will drive us everywhere, will uh, do our jobs, and could actually function in a world whereby humans need to have to keep social distances. So this is where data ma- matters. This is where innovation matters again. And the regime that governs data and could lead us to this full automation or half automation in the world uh, is protected partially by IP, intellectual property rights, whether it's patents, copyright, or trade secrets, or industrial designs that Laurent will talk about in a a second. Uh, These things are also governed by data regimes. And this is something we should also bear in mind, that data is controlled partially by intellectual property, but also partially by new regimes in the world for data protection, which as we know in the EU, for instance, the famous GDPR is something which businesses also have to bear in mind because we, when we are conducting our businesses around the world, in Europe, we might have to adhere to different rules that also apply there because of the value of data, because that Various policymakers around the world are valuing data to that extent that it needs protection. Some of it is by IP law, some is not. So the move that to Industry 4.0 in general to automation requires us now to think about the, how our business should adapt to these changes. It requires us to go more digital in the sense that understanding that uh, We shouldn't stop technology. We should understand it. We shouldn't fear it. There are so many opportunities within it. And these opportunities will come whether we'll have crises like COVID-19 and whether we won't, because we have to start thinking about these things. The, The technology itself will not be stopped easily. My final word in that extent is that it, this all applies to various things that we can do. Uh, one of them would be something which Laurent could also uh, continue talking about is 3D printing and the use of 3D printing in general uh, domestically when we cannot use export or import anymore for let's say a month or two, then we have to rely on, on ourselves. So how do, does IP interplay there? And we have to think about the security of things in general, the security of the conversations that we're having through these things, through these meetings, through what we're talking about. This is relates to trade secrets, which I discussed, and the security of the devices that we're using and the security of, of everything that we're communicating within. All of these things will help us have a better digital future. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Elda. I think we'll have uh, Professor Lohan back. So I think we should just move back to him so he can conclude. Uh, his, his... Yes, thank you very much, uh, Filippi, and thank you very much, uh, Elda, of course. Uh, for the first time since the start of the pandemic, the technology abandoned me. And we see precisely what it means uh, when we are at, uh, at meetings. So um, I uh, guess uh, since we had already prepared what we would discuss with, uh, with Eldar, I uh, uh, guess that we have covered his part. And uh, I would wish to, uh, I was just finishing mentioning the importance of patents. And there are two other aspects. 
Uh, as Eldar has pointed out, there is a major importance in also using industrial designs. Precisely, um, if patents are extremely useful for artificial intelligence protection and uh, for technologies connected to uh, science and as well as medicines, um, industrial designs that can be protected in Brazil through INPI and that can be protected abroad uh, in many, many countries through the Paris Convention and in which it is to be hoped that one day Brazil will also join the Hague system uh, as most uh, Latin American countries. Industrial designs uh, protection as uh, per the Brazilian system, 10 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 years, up to 25, offer immense opportunities to business to promote their creativity, uh, in particular in 3D printing, and to permit these product products to have a market. So, uh, talking initially from patents, then moving to industrial designs, moving to the topics of copyright and as well as data protection, as mentioned by Eldar, uh, we should also not forget what is the business card of businesses. And the business card of a business is its trademark, which in the digital world means something slightly different. It means mostly the domain name. We all know for those who are IP specialists and we less know for those who are less IP specialists that Trademarks are granted by the states further to applications made to the states. So in this case, in P of Brazil, registers Brazilian trademarks and Brazil being part of the WIPO Mad called Madrid system, the international system for trademarks. Trademarks can be registered in many, many countries of the world, including North America, Europe, China, Japan. Uh, the domain names are granted, as many business operators know, in a very different way. First arrived, first served, through uh, internet providers, domain name providers, for very, very cheap price. And of course, it is very, very important for companies that are not much in the uh, digital marketplace to uh, to register domain names, not only for the company, but also for each of the main uh, flagged products of the same company. So it is very important to um, register them, connected to trademarks, avoiding short, short circuits so that the trademarks space, which is given thanks to national laws, be not impeded by the main names that try to hijack the trademark territory. So uh, the business card of companies is uh, domain names, and it is very, very important that this be used systematically by uh, big and small companies for the company trademark, for the products trademarks, and also for whatever operation where there is a risk that a domain name be uh, created abroad and uh, blocks the development of the marks. This is why uh, IT lawyers can also help on this. This is uh, the main names uh, are uh, connected to branding, but they are also connected to uh, uh, respecting the trademarks. And as such, it is very, very important for Brazilian companies to continue to expand in this field because this is the digital address of the company. So the website and the domain name. The website made of software that is protected by copyright, by a design for its aesthetics, by a patent for software in some countries. The, um, domain, the domain names, which is super, super important so that uh, uh, the domain name of the company be also protected as well as all the products. As such, uh, the uh, transformation, the digitalization of companies go through these basic steps. So making a plan, making a plan to develop technologies that would permit the business to operate or to buy technologies. So being 
license, licensees of technologies, getting technologies, and being sure to get the right licenses. Licenses of patents in this case, licenses of copyrights. Licenses of trademarks, if you are clients, if you are customers, or trade, owning trademarks, if you are company owners as such, and owning trademarks for the company name and for the products. And at the same time, owning the domain names that are connected to the trademark, since after all, the way to trade is through, in large part, through the domain names. By doing so, Eldar and myself have tried to uh, present all the options that are possible for promoting uh, digital transformation with the support of IP. Of course, there is the carrot and there is the stick. If the, um, the intellectual property uh, tools, which are patents, trademarks, industrial designs, are not properly, uh, copyrights are not properly uh, uh, in place, they cannot be then properly defended by the IP specialists who support companies' uh, enforcement of their rights. And this is something which is also very important to know. In this very case, we also know that not only companies uh, get digital transformation, but also through um, arbitration, that can be done also through digital tools, arbitration for IP rights, mediation for IP rights, arbitration and mediation on domain names, including through the WIPO tool. There are many, many possibilities then to protect the uh, creativity that has been made uh, by uh, the uh, digital transformation. So uh, I would say as a last word of this presentation, which was uh, brilliantly interrupted thanks to uh, Eldar Haber, uh, the, um, I would say protect your IP, protect your IP by uh, patents, trademarks, industrial designs, copyrights, and also domain names. This is your business card, your business card for the future. And of course, if your IP is protected, your digital transformation goes on the safe way and protects your business for its further growth. The choice of IP tools is often uh, advised by IP lawyers and by branding specialists. And this is something to be very, to be considered. IP companies, IP specialists support us in this crucial job. So I know that Brazil is very active, Brazilian companies are very active, but we are all to be more active in a connected world when connections work. Thank you very much. Philippe. Yep. Thank you, Laurent, and thank you, Elda, for both brilliant presentations. I think you managed to cover it all in just a uh, a uh, few minutes, you managed to cover, you know, patents, uh, trademarks, domain names, licensing activities, copyrights, and uh, Elda went a little bit further talking about IoT and uh, protection of database and so on. Uh, very interesting, very informative presentations from both of you. Uh, I'd like to make uh, some questions. I'll start with uh, Professor Loha. Uh, you know that uh, protecting intellectual property demands expenses, for, uh, especially for, you know, medium-sized companies. So how, how can they benefit from those expenses? How, how can we transform those expenses in investment? And so uh, does intellectual property assets enhance the profitability or the market value of those enterprises? And uh, if you could please talk a little bit more and uh, talk about licensing. And uh, also you have a very interesting article talking about securitization of IP rights. So if you could please explain to us what it is and uh, how can uh, uh, small companies benefit from that? Yes, thank you very much, Philippe, for your uh, very broad question. Uh, yes, there is a need for company to pro for companies to protect their assets. So, uh, from uh, traditional companies that don't do them enough, 
two digital companies that sometimes have no time being pushed by the fast development of technologies to uh, uh, make the right steps. There are costs. There are costs, no doubt, but uh, these costs may also be alleviated. There are a few programs that exist, uh, including in Brazil, if I remember well, uh, INP has a program that supports small and medium-sized enterprises in Brazil, in this very respect. Line is with us. Yes. Uh, so these programs are extremely important and they permit for small and medium-sized enterprises to get tools that uh, offer them protection with uh, uh, facilities in terms of costs. Uh, we, I was mentioning the example of uh, INP in Brazil, but there are also regional authorities, chambers of commerce that support small and medium-sized enterprises in order to alleviate the costs, including the costs uh, or advisory services of uh, IP agents who would support companies in explaining them their first steps. Uh, intellectual property is an investment, an investment so that your assets are protected. And it's very, very clear. If you don't protect your domain name, which is the simplest example and the cheapest thing to get, we know pretty well that people online, as soon as they see your business, would register the domain name in order to try to sell it to you later on. So it is self-evident that there is an, a need, that there is an element of the resources of a small company to be dedicated to uh, the protection of intellectual property rights. And same thing for larger companies when they want to get digital. This is a cost. This is a cost, but this is also a cost that can create benefits. Well, first benefits, if you are attacked in your territory, then you can defend yourself because you have intellectual property uh, rights that can be enforced. Question. This is connected with uh, licensing. Licensing is something which is very important because licensing permits, of course, to license in technologies, but also to license out your technologies. So Eldar spoke on one of his favorite topics, which is uh, Internet of Things. And we know that through Internet of Things, there are uh, uh, dozens of products that companies could uh, and technologies that companies could license, license to patents, but also license, licensing their own marks to subsidiaries that could work. And actually, there are in Brazil millions of licensees who use trademarks of licensors. The uh, actual phenomenon, in particular, uh, the phenomenon linked to the uh, pandemia, makes that companies need even more licensees, perhaps of different types. Instead of being retailers who are licensees, you need licensees who can produce locally things that cannot be exported, that cannot be, uh, that cannot move. And 3D printing uh, is one good example on this. There are no examples of companies that are uh, with 3D printing facilities that got licenses for production of goods. So this is something which is very, very important. The most innovative tool that is being progressively developed is securitization of intellectual property rights. And this really relates to the future of intellectual property. We knew, we talking of intellectual property lawyers this time, we knew that normally there were rights that we are creating and defending at courts if needed. These rights circulate through selling, assigning the rights, or through licenses. But there is a third way, which is fast developing and which is getting credit, access to credit, through the intellectual property right itself. So making, creating, securitization of the rights, obtaining 
funds from a banker thanks to creating a security on the intellectual property right. Um, some big US European companies, in order to get better access to credit, to get their development, give securities on their marks mostly, but there are also securities on copyrights, on patents the system is just developing, so that you, you give an asset to a bank or to a partner as a security, just as any security would work. And these non-materialized assets permit to companies to develop very successfully. A large um, US multinational food retailer in the field of sweets has used these tools, for example, in order to get an, a large access to credit, which permitted itself to uh, develop all over the planet. So um, large European companies use it as well. And it is hoped that in Brazil, securitization and collateralization of the IP rights will make large progresses as well, because there is there an avenue. Leaders in this for the time being are Europe and North America. So contrary to uh, uh, other new trends in intellectual property, where there is a huge, um, let's say, development in Eastern Asia, Europe and North America have the lead for the time being in securitization and collateralization. Bearing in mind the size of Brazil, being a federal country, but being half of Latin America, there is no doubt that in this very field, there is an immense avenue. Also, Bovespa, the uh, stock exchange of Sao Paulo, being one of the big players of the world, means that there, there are immense possibilities for uh, Brazilian companies. I am not advising in this respect or saying that this should be done in each and every field. There are things companies should try to avoid to securitize. But in some fields of intellectual property, there is space to give a security on a, on a mark, on a patent, in order to get access to credit in many formats. So this is an option, a very innovative option. And I thank very much, Philippe, to, give, to uh, give me the opportunity to present this very, very topic. Thank you, Philippe. Very nice, thank you. Thank you, Professor Aloha. Professor Elda, let's talk a little bit about IoT. I know that this is one of your favorite topics. And uh, let's, so let's talk about uh, privacy in general. We do have you know, uh, new uh, data protection laws coming up all over the world. Uh, some of them uh, in, being inspired by the European in initiative on in this sense. So um, do you think that considering that today, today we live in this, this world where, where um, we have the expectation for privacy, but we also have the expectation for convenience coming from IoT, from uh, the several devices that we use and uh, the use of our data in our benefit. Do you think that there is any kind of conflict uh, on that? And uh, specifically, during this pandemic uh, era, uh, we can see that several governments have been taking initiatives to monitor people uh, through apps or through their mobile phones using geolocation uh, so as to try to control their isolation or their moves within certain locations. Do you think that um, there is any kind of uh, conflict of interest here, you know, a, a government trying to save lives and to uh, protect health? And on the other hand, we have, you know, privacy issues on uh, our smartphones being monitored uh, 24 7. So, what, what's your opinion on that? Trying to have. I mean, uh, this is such a huge and important topic of things that are various, they are just out there right now. But I think that, uh, I mean, you're right on the money in the sense that uh, starting to talk about privacy, first of all, prior to the pandemic. And let's begin from the first step. You, you asked about IoT and privacy. And I think that this trade off between convenience 
and and things that are very easy to say hey alexa and just she plays whatever you want but on the other hand she's also always on so something in between we might lose our privacy to a great extent and in between i think this is where we start we have to start thinking about uh it's a great thing that regulators are talking about data protection and it's a very important move but i don't think that the law is the only solution to the problem of privacy in the 21st century. So privacy, as we know this, there, we've heard in the last, past 20 years or so that privacy is dead, get over it, and all these types of idioms and stuff that we heard, quotes about privacy. And I think that many countries said in the world that it's not like that, because we have to bear in mind that uh, privacy is not just, the right to privacy is not just one right, it consists of various rights, human rights and liberties, which are important in our society, which have to has, has a lot of connection to freedom of expression, things that are important, values that are important for us. So if we lose that, we lose a lot of other things that are very, very important for us, even for those who say that we, they have nothing to hide. So I think that privacy as a right is a very important thing. And I think the law is moving into a very good direction. However, we have to consider technological means as well that can help us preserve privacy. And this is where I connect to your second question because privacy by design is one of the things that we have to strive to do as a society for those who develop technology and for lawmakers and for us as users. So one good example would be the, the, the pandemic. So one way to, to try to see where people are going or where the pandemic is spreading is to basically monitor them all the time, right? Use these surveillance methods that in Israel we've seen maybe the most intrusive ones in liberal democracies uh, by which uh, um, we had very, very intensive, until today actually, we had very, very intensive uh, monitoring and surveillance of those who were suspected of being a carrier of COVID-19. Uh, and this is one way to do it. And this is a very privacy intrusive measure. But there, you can also have an app, which we have in Israel, which is open source, open code. It is a, it, it's actually offered by the Ministry of Health, but all the data that is checking whether or not you were within any proximity for those who had COVID-19 occurs within your own device. And you also consent to this in your own device. And only upon the device showing that from extracting the data from the Ministry of Health to your own data in your own device, telling you if you were near a COVID-19 known patient, then you can decide what you do want to do with this information. And this is two examples of how to preserve privacy and preserve public health at the same time. But what would the public choose? That's a different question. And here goes what we need to know about the things that are within this surveillance capitalism, but also surveillance as a tool for governments to aid us in this important thing to aid us for against this horrible pandemic. But also if we can find better measures to achieve similar outcomes, why shouldn't we use them? And this is where technology comes into play, the law comes into place and society comes into play. So I think in a gist, no, we shouldn't give up our privacy, not even to fight this pandemic. We can balance it in some instances where it is necessary and when it is proportionate, but we shouldn't give it up. Well, very interesting. Actually, I'm going to pick up one of your phrases to connect uh, both presentations of both of you, uh, uh, you said a very interesting thing that uh, you shouldn't. We shouldn't think about privacy only in terms of law. We should also think about in terms of the technology itself, and we can use technology uh, as you know, a good example of privacy by design. We could use technology in order to uh, uh, enhance and improve privacy in general. So we could use this technology in our favor. So. Uh, Connecting to the, the, the presentation of Loha, uh, Professor Loha, we could invest in developing privacy tools and later on benefit from that in licensing this technology or even using this securitization model that Professor Loha mentioned. So uh, I think that getting to know 
the direction that the law is, that the law is, is going and that the society is going in general and uh, investing research and development of those tools, you, can, you could uh, benefit from the IP of developing those technology tools. Don't you agree with that? I think this is something crucial. I think really that uh, uh, we can, we shall be able in the future to do it so. Uh, however, I share uh, Elda Haber's point of view that uh, we need also safeguards and these go, uh, these are safeguards that should be inserted in each branch of law to be absolutely sure that there is no, uh, no invasion in our sphere that shouldn't take place. So, uh, so uh, there is, of course, a big connection and a big combination in the fact that we can use uh, new tools uh, for uh, using better intellectual property or creativity coming from intellectual property. There is no doubt as well that we have important needs to get uh, the right legislation around it. And this is very important in all parts of the world. Very nice. Well, now I'm going to uh, turn the mic back to Erika. Uh, I guess Erika would like to interact with our special guests to collect some questions from them. And meanwhile, uh, from the general audience, if you could please uh, put in your questions here in the chat, in YouTube chat, I'm going to read your questions by the end. Uh, I guess we'll have some time saved by the end. So Erika, it's on you. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you very much, Mr. Edo and Mr. Lohan, for this excellent presentation. Um, let's turn to the audience, to our guests. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I think you have covered all the questions, Felipe. I don't see anyone. Yeah, it was, it was rich. A lot of the questions are already answered, <laughs> I think. So... Uh, I could uh, stay on here and talking and making questions uh, the whole afternoon, no problem at all. But actually, uh, I've got a question here from the general audience, uh, Ms. Elvira Carvajal. Uh, I would like to hear more about database rights. Uh, she, uh, I think she's addressing, uh, well, any of those of the presenters that would like to answer this question. So uh, a little bit, uh, some more comments on database rights, please. Well, I could talk first on the European regime, uh, which is, of course, a very, very strong one since it protects not only uh, databases uh, that have intellectual property contents, but also databases without intellectual property contents. So uh, this is a, a specificity, and it is a, a specificity on which uh, the European Union having this double regime creates a bit like uh, Eldar has mentioned earlier on privacy issue, uh, an approach of a fortress on databases. This fortress on databases is, of course, extremely useful for those who uh, create. Uh, it has also some costs for society. So uh, in this very case, I think it is very important that there be a good intellectual property protection uh, for databases and that uh, uh, for uh, databases with no intellectual property content, there is some element of recognition so that there is enough fluidity in the market so that licenses can develop in the right way and uh, in this respect, uh, it is uh, very important for Brazilian operators and operators throughout South America to have uh, appropriate legislation uh, that permit licensing in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in an easy way and without too many bureaucracy. One of the risks in the licensing operations is that there be a lot of red tape and on this, we, I think we all agree in this audience this is, that this is what we do not want for this. 
I will continue, Laurent, just saying that in the normative sense, uh, these uh, database rights uh, that where they exist or they generally exist to recognize the investment that one has made in compiling a database. And in the EU, as Laurent mentioned, it is recognized under Directive from 96. And, and it is also mentioned in various agreements. In, uh, I don't, I'm not a big uh, Brazilian uh, expert on, uh, on data and IP, but uh, as far as I know, there's a law from 98 that also uh, uh, confirms beta base owners exclusive rights uh, in some instances, but once again, I'm not uh, a Brazilian law expert, but general, uh, this, there's this notion by which it is recognized when either it's not copyrightable because it's not creative enough, but as Laurent mentioned, I think that it's important to infer to the rights also that IP protects, and there are many of them that could be under these um, different uh, rights managements. Nice. Um, Erika, someone from the, from the audience? No, not really, I think. We are done, right? Any other question? Okay, no? so, um, okay, uh, one additional question uh, to Professor Elda. You, you, you have written a very interesting book, which is uh, Criminal Copyright, where uh, you talk about the gap between uh, the legislation and the enforcement of copyright in general, right? So, uh, so what lessons can we learn from that? So should uh, the businesses invest also in technology that may help them control their copyrights or they should just trust the law and the enforcement of the law? So what, what's your conclusion on that? Please tell us a little bit about this famous book. Thank you very much uh, uh, for bringing out the book. Uh, uh, it was such a pleasure writing it. And um, the gap that I'm talking about within the book, uh, within, within one of the chapters, is, is an interesting gap which I found statistically uh, when I studied the US and the UK. What I want to see, I saw all this, I, I, I described the criminalization of copyright to the extent of something which has began uh, first time in humanity in the UK in 1862, uh, but then in the US in 1897. And we have witnessed this move towards harsher and harsher copyright laws in the criminal aspect. I'm not talking about the civil lawsuits right now, the criminal aspects out of it. And then in the US, we have witnessed a peak in 1997 when they enacted something which is called the No Electronic Theft Act or the NET Act, by which end users were criminalized, at least on the books. And uh, what happened there is that if you're an end user for a period of an amount of time, if you caught, get caught infringing copyright uh, in the amount of either $1,000 or two, two, uh, $2,500 uh, in the amount of six months, in the duration of six months, then this is a criminal offense, you might go to prison. And one of the things that I wanted to see, I wanted to see what happens in the litigation. So we have this law, how many people are actually uh, being prosecuted for criminal copyright offenses? So what I've discovered, and this is the gap, that we've seen all these congressional movements all around the world, not just in the US, of making copyright laws more and more criminal. But there's a gap in enforcement because when you go to enforcers on the criminal realm, you see that, first of all, there's not a lot of enforced criminal enforcement while there, re there was a rise in infringement in general. So this is where the gap starts. I try to understand why, why does it happen? Why do we have so many criminal laws for copyright? And by the way, also for trademarks in some instances, not in patents, but in trademarks often, uh, why do we have this gap? So uh, um, in general here, this, this is where I leave the audience uh, waiting for the answer. So if you wanna know the answer, you have to read the book uh, because it will be too lengthy also to discuss, but I have to make some promotions. But uh, for your question in, in, for corporations, I would say that uh, do not, I think that relying on criminal law to that extent is not the, the proper way to do it. I think that intellectual property in general should remain in the civil realm. There are some criminal aspects, and those are very rare cases by which I think that the government should step in and enforce harder. 
but I think that most businesses for the things that we're talking about in digitization, uh, those are the things that mostly could be handled through civil means. And IP owners should definitely exercise their civil rights when they uh, have to, uh, and they should. I'm not sure that it is uh, the role of criminal law to do that. Ron wants to interrupt. Thank you. I, I would just add one point connected to what Eldar has mentioned. One, one thing which is super important and is often neglected is the role of intellectual property agents in promoting good quality rights. If we have, uh, if we manage to have intellectual property rights that are strong, the uh, risks uh, that uh, Eldar has mentioned are of course mitigated. And uh, there is a trend in companies and sometimes in the IP family to consider that uh, uh, creating IP uh, is a cost. And creating good IP, that means with the support of IP agents, is a cost. And actually, this is not the case. This is a saving on the future to avoid the scenarios that legislators have created that tend to criminalize any, uh, uh, any wrongdoing, any wrongdoing of what would be a potential right owner, and rightly criminalize violations that uh, may happen. That is so much true. And also it reminds me, uh, Professor Laha, if you could please uh, talk, I guess we have covered many, many aspects of intellectual property and also technology, but one aspect that I, uh, I feel uh, we haven't mentioned yet is the role of universities. Do you think that universities play an important role in knowledge, trans knowledge transfer and uh, in the development of IP in general? Thank you very much for your, for your question, uh, Philippe, in particular because uh, I had the pleasure to write long ago for WIPO a guide on uh, development of technology transfer from universities to society, well, to the marketplace in Latin America, including in Brazil. So this is a subject which actually I love and I wrote other publications on this. There is no single doubt that uh, uh, universities play a key role. They play a key role for, uh, for many reasons. They, in universities, the objective is not to make profit initially, is to make science shining. So science is made and is developing very often by people who are volunteers and work day and night, including for free or for small salaries, in order to, to follow the research. Of course, businessmen know it very well. And this is why universities are good science providers at a cheaper price than the marketplace is. And there, there is an asset that universities start to develop. They know that they can create wealth out of their science. This wealth is important for the universities, but the cost of science developed at universities is cheaper than science developed in companies, for companies, and for governments. So universities are a good deal for companies as well in order to create alliances. Universities as licensors are uh, interested in getting money to further fuel their research. And for the licensee, they can pay less for developing a technology than they would have done if they had done it in a company itself. So uh, universities, uh, the role of universities in technology transfer has always existed, but it will further develop. Brazil has some brilliant examples uh, in all parts of the country, but in particular in the southern part of the country, uh, where many, many, well, in the center and southern part of the country, where many universities are actively fueling the market uh, with their innovations. And this is something that is a major asset. Actually, 
uh, both uh, Professor Elda Haber and myself have been in contact with Brazilian universities because of the high, their high quality in research, the high connections all over the world in uh, common projects. And this has benefited over the last 15, 20 years massively to uh, the periods of growth in Brazil. So this is something very, very important. Companies uh, and IP agents should always remember that universities are technology providers at a very honest price and are very flexible because what they want is not profit, but is making more and more and more technologies for society. So tech transfer and uh, universities and Brazilian universities, yes, yes, and yes, this is a tool that supports development of uh, a business that also transform digitally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Laha. Thank you, Professor Elda. Uh, I guess, um, well, come up. Yeah, we had a last question here from the audience. Uh, Mr. Carl Carlos Nogueira asking Dr. Haber, how do you see the relation between the internet and children after this pandemic? And I can also add that uh, Dr. Haber has an interesting article that comments on the relationship between uh, IoT and children in general. So please, uh, Dr. Elda, if you could please uh, enlighten us a little bit about this conflict. Yes, uh, I've actually, I've, um, um, this is part of the research which I'm conducting these days even. Uh, there's another article going on uh, just in uh, about uh, three, three weeks to a month, which is called the Internet of Children. So you're right on the money. Uh, it's in Illinois Law Review, it's forthcoming. Uh, yes, I, I am researching this, this uh, very, very important era area of law and I think that um, one of the things that I've, I've came uh, to see for instance was the use of technology and and in the use of technology what I mean is that one of the things that we haven't thought about for instance when we have our children growing up and this is the things that I'm talking about often is that when they're let's say eight or nine or ten year olds uh, they get a phone they get a smartphone maybe and they we, they start to be more and more online so we as parents have these tools for monitoring them sometimes etc cetera, etc cetera. so I've, I've written about these issues which are very troubling for a lot of aspects of privacy and 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 protection of, of children's rights in general but what we have witnessed in this pandemic, for instance, is how a five-year-old and a six-year-old are suddenly uh, have they have a Zoom meeting. Why? Because their kindergarten te teacher has a Zoom meeting with them. And here is where things get trickier because for once, no one thought about security. So we have witnessed, and this is, I say, this is also awful. We have witnessed this Zoom bombing or things that uh, uh, under a conversation with the kindergarten teacher, uh, hackers come in and you don't have to be a hacker. Those Zoom meetings at first, no one thought that someone will enter them. So they didn't even have a password. All you had to do is just Google them. You can find, you can find these meetings ongoing. Then we've seen passwords, but then I, I saw that the passwords at the beginning was one, two, three, four, five. This is how you make bad security. But then these children are actually, uh, they see images and things which could be horrifying. And no five-year-old or six-year-old should see those things, but there's no way to stop that because mom and dad are working right now and they have to be in the kindergarten. Another child has to be uh, in the class with his or her teacher, etc. So I think that the interplay has to teach us this thing. We have to bear in mind that tomorrow your child, and it doesn't matter if she or he is four or six or 10, will go online. And then we have to think about how to make the online world more secure for our children. This goes from the other way around. We have to understand us as parents and caregivers, we have to understand the implications of using the internet. And when our children are using that, we cannot be 24 seven guardians of what's going on there in their device and online. So we have to use technology. This is where AI will come into play more and more as this also another caregiver, another guardian, and this will shift us to another dimension by which we will have to discuss 
uh, platforms and platforms and how they govern our uh, lives in general and how they will govern our children more. And this is where the law might interplay again. And we will have to understand how we should govern platforms as well, something which is very a hot debate right now in the US uh, for those who are familiar with Section 230 uh, uh, for the uh, communication and decency law, which basically gives them some immunity or gives them broad immunity. But now uh, some things might change there a little bit. But this is just a general topic, which, I, as I said, we can talk about it for four hours. But this is this is in a nutshell what I can say about this important topic. Oh, thank you, Erika. Well, great. I think now we're running out of time. So uh, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here with us today. Um, we have had around 100 among guests and YouTubers, and this is a great record for our IP meeting. So thank you again for joining us. I hope seeing you on the next IP meeting. Thank you.